right. This is episode five of Faith in Film. So what we've been doing is um, going over different films that have a, a theme of faith in them and using them as a platform to kind of jump off into conversations about Catholicism, about our faith. So Father Dave Nix was kind enough to reach out to his friend Mel Gibson to have him on so we could discuss Hacksaw Ridge and being that it's Lent. He's got a severe penance and he's come on the show with us. So I'm going to throw it over to Father Dave Nix and let him run this one a little bit and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. And we yeah, all got well, our hair shirts on. We all got our hair shirts on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for joining us, Mr. Mel Gibson. We really appreciate yep. it. Hey, Here's the history of uh, good. Just a quick um, update or uh, explanation. I think a lot of our listeners have seen Hacksaw Ridge. It was made in 2015, hit the theaters in 2016, and it is the story of Desmond Doss. He was a combat medic who is also a pacifist, true true story of a Seventh-day Adventist. He was in the Pacific Theater, and he saved 75 men, mostly GIs, but even some of the enemy uh, out in Japan in some very, very gruesome battles. And, you know, we were talking about which movie. We figured Mel's probably overwhelmed on requests on Braveheart. We didn't think with a lot of the silly chat that we usually endure, the passion to be appropriate. Uh, we didn't want to, you know, open up to just thousands of questions on the resurrection. So I said, what if we did Hacksaw Ridge? I personally love the movie because I'm a World War II buff. I'm an ex-paramedic and I'm a priest. And uh, so, Mel, how did you first learn about Desmond Doss, this uh, pacifist, Seventh-day Adventist who saved 75 lives, which is really extraordinary for a combat medic even in World War II? Right. Well, there was a, a guy who had optioned the story and um, had had a script uh, written, uh, a guy called Bill Mechanic, who used to be an executive over at uh, 20th Century Fox. And uh, he uh, he helmed, he was in, in charge when they helmed projects like Titanic, you know, big ones in him. So, um, and I knew Bill from, from the old days, but he just, this was just, he was independent now. And he just popped in one day. He said, I got a script. I want you to look at it. It's about this guy. He really existed. And uh, not only did he give me a script, but he gave me some books uh, that I could look at to catch up and find out who this uh, man was. And, uh, you know, I found it a very <clears throat> uh, compelling story, uh, uh, particularly the, uh, the, the, the pacifist aspect of it, because he wasn't cowardly. He wanted to go into battle. He just didn't want to kill anyone, but he wanted to save lives instead of taking them and uh, without a weapon in, in a hostile territory. So that, to me, that's real guts. And uh, uh, he uh, was awarded the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor for for his uh, service to his country and his fellow man. But he uh, was um, he was unusual. In fact, he may have been the most badass of all those guys. Mm -hmm. In in that he didn't just um, in a split second decide to do something extraordinary and outrageous and like most of us probably couldn't do. He premeditatedly and 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 uh, uh he just did it again and again he just kept going in and doing the same thing again and again putting his own life at risk to drag a brother out you know and um uh, and save his life so you know to me i thought wow uh, of all the heroes you know this guy was uh unlikely because everyone thought he was a, a nut and a coward and everything else but uh it turned out that he was like one of the bravest men alive, you know. You know, in the green room, when we were still waiting for, I said to the guys here, I, if I remember correctly, you were talking to Garfield, Andrew Garfield, who played the role of Desmond Doss. And if I remember correctly, I saw one of these interviews where the two of you said, yeah, if I was in training with these GIs, the guys who one day I would save their life, here they are beating him up. I think one of you said, yeah, I wouldn't forgive these guys. I'd punch him right in the face. Yeah. And and I said, you know, that's pretty extraordinary for Mel because before we hit record, I said, we all know Mel could play the role of Braveheart. We know we know he could be the Patriot. You're physically a very strong man. But then for you to admit, if it was you, I don't know if it was you or Andrew, to say you couldn't do that, that's a um, that really shows how difficult forgiveness is, um, how how hard it is to love your enemy. We are all traditional Catholics. All four of us are Latin Mass Catholics. We like, you know, we often talk about the. Uh, more exciting, tough virtues, fortitude, chastity, and stuff. Forgiveness 
sometimes that's put on the back burner as kind of a wimpy virtue or something like that. But there's something in this movie that, even though he's a Seventh-day Adventist, reflects Christ's own line, greater love no man has than this to lay down his life for his friends. So I guess my question is, what are four traditional Catholics, Latin mass Catholic guys, why are we discussing a pacifist, Mel? Um, well, I think Christ was a pacifist, <laughs> pretty much, except for when he when he cleaned the temple out that time. But uh, <clears throat> I think... Uh, it is a very difficult uh, thing to achieve forgiveness. I found it the most difficult thing of all. Yeah. Um, but when I've ever managed to sort of get myself to a place where I can actually do it, because actually, and and it usually comes through exhaustion mm. of of uh, <laughs> of having the resentment weighing you down. I mean, it's just. It's just like torture. So you, you say, man, am I sick of this? So it's usually uh, giving yourself a break to go ahead and do that. And I like that. Find, yeah, and it does, it does give you a break. Yeah, St. Vincent uh, de Paul says forgiveness forgives, or forgiveness heals the wound in your own heart, not the other's heart. It's really interesting. Yeah. It heals the wound in your own heart. Yeah. Um, and it, it's important we're talking about this in Lent. Uh, the, the last movie we actually talked about, or two movies ago, was an Eastern Orthodox movie. Even though we're Catholics, we talked about The Island. It was a movie that just swept Russian called Ostrov. And the Eastern Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox, they have an entire Sunday. It's actually the first Sunday of the Great Fast, which we in the West call Lent. They have an entire Sunday called the, the Sunday of Forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And so they start Divine Liturgy in the first Sunday. And you go around the church, both, again, Eastern Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, they go around the church. I believe it's the first divine liturgy, first Sunday divine liturgy. And you actually have to forgive the people in your church. You go up and you ask forgiveness. I don't know if it's for specific things, but you say their name and and you ask forgiveness. So it's kind of apropos that we're talking about forgiveness in Lent because it is a lot, a lot harder than most people admit. And I think that's one reason I picked this movie and asked you guys if we could talk about it, because um, what that guy does is above and beyond, not just on the battlefield, but but what happens in his heart is above and beyond. Sure. I mean, it, it allows him to be, um, <clears throat> it allows him to be courageous. You know, he has some of the virtues that only come from above. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it, it, you know, I, it, it's interesting. I, I, I talked to a bunch of guys uh, one time and they're, um, <laughs> they're very, very specifically chosen for what they do. And uh, of all the special forces guys, these guys impress me the most because they're the hostage rescue team, right? Oh, yeah. And a lot of them are chosen from the ranks of other special forces like the Rangers or the, the SEALs or Green Berets. And, and even some of those guys who've gotten through, who've jumped those hurdles, they can't even get into the HRT, you know? Mm. And um, But what those guys have and why they're chosen is because in a heartbeat, they will choose your life over theirs. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And and they'll and they will not even hesitate. And there we and, have the line: greater love no man has in this than to lay down his life for his friends. But it's interesting because I talked to a lot of those guys, and I'd say probably 75% of them are guys of, of a lot of faith, you know. Yes. And um, you know, I'm not saying that. <laughs> There's some pretty gutsy guys who, who don't, you know, they say they're agnostic or something, but I don't know, man. I don't know how you do that yeah. if, you know, that's the way you are. But uh, so it's. Yeah, uh, I have a, there's a guy I've had on my podcast. He's Mike and he was commander at SEAL Team 6 and uh, he was involved in some of those things. And, um, you know, one of the most fascinating things about the SEALs to me, and this has been a real heartbreak in the priesthood where everyone just stab you in the back pretty quickly. Other priests are just stabbing in the back pretty quickly. And for the SEALs, though, it's more important that you get your brother on the battlefield home to his family than it is that you even get yourself home. Yeah, I thought I was joining that in the priesthood, but this isn't my my vent session. Um, just talking to SEALs also, it's really quite astonishing how um, they go into this. Um, I, I, and I agree with you. There's a lot more guys who are evangelical Christians and traditional Catholics than we might realize in the SEAL teams, the Rangers, um, but they all seem to have this notion. It's more important. I save this other guy's life than my own. 
Yeah, um, it's, it's humility. It's 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 humble and it's it's love, you know. And it's like yeah. I think these are virtues that come from the, you know, they come from above. And, and you and, know the uh, the canon canon law. It's not just new school modernism that doesn't let us priests take weapons into battle. Even the old school canon said priests were not to carry weapons into uh, to battle. Even you know with the Crusaders, medieval 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 wars and stuff and stuff. Yep. Um, priests were not. Now occasionally you hear these stories that they'd pick up some spear and the Muslim would be coming and they'd have to stab a guy to defend somebody else, or whatever. But normally. We don't carry weapons. And I think because our hands were consecrated for the mass and we were made for martyrdom. And in that sense, the martyrs were all in reflection of Christ. You see something of Desmond Doss, even though he's a Seventh-day Adventist um, in this. But um, don't you think lay people, though, are uh, they're called to defend themselves? H how do you square the, the fact that lay people are supposed to defend themselves away with, you know, when he's in um, basic training or boot camp, all these people be shouldn't he have? stood up for himself a little bit there? Uh, well, that was his code. I think he, and he was, um, you know, I think given the right circumstances, it was just them picking on him. He could take it, you know, uh, he was a tough guy, but I think uh, say if he was at home with his wife or his mother and somebody was picking on them, I'm pretty sure he would have got active. To <laughs> well, that's, yeah. yeah. Rob, and, Rob, we're going to mention that scene when he takes up the gun against his dad and he realizes what he's capable of. Yeah, yeah, and um, uh, you know, I think that was, I think that might have been a. I don't think he actually did that uh, okay. in real life. A little but, artistic license on that one. Yeah, a little artistic license, but I think I think he did have uh, a troublesome uh, childhood, and uh, mm -hmm. but he was raised uh, strictly Seventh Day Adventist, and uh, it just struck him terribly hard. And he, there was this little picture on the wall that he saw, and it just was like. It always like thought it was the worst thing that a, a man was capable of killing his own brother, mm. and uh, so he he had vowed not to, to ever, you know, wander into that Cain and Abel territory, you know. In fact, in, instead, oh, instead he, he he ended up getting shrapnel in his leg, and he ended up with a cane, but he was disabled. Ah, uh, so. and he lived till two thousand six, very late, quite he, yeah, quite a long life. Yeah, and you know, that movie came out in 2016. It was pre-COVID. We have to watch out some for some of these uh, YouTube algorithms. It was pre-C19. Um, things seemed better in the world then. But one of the things we noticed in retrospect, maybe the medical mandates, all this stuff, um, Anthony had some really great insights. I think he's watched the movie once or twice. We've all been really excited for you joining us. But just the notion of conviction, what does it mean for a man to actually be convicted of something? And Anthony had some really great insights on... Um, you know, but what he had to do on that medical mandate and really how that movie set the scene for a lot of us to have to hold to our convictions, even when everybody was against it. It was really a perfectly timed movie. Maybe it could have come a couple of years later, closer to 2020 when everything fell apart. But yeah. that movie really spoke to a lot of us who had some hard decisions. Yes. Oh, yeah. And and these things happen. And it's those the moral courage <clears throat> in the face of. You know, it's like Athanasius or one of those guys, you know, and exactly. everything come, everything just, it just, they make you look like a monkey. Athanasius and, uh, Contramundum. He was against yeah. the whole world. Against the world. Yeah. Against and, the uh, world. yeah. And he was right. And he was right. Yeah. The truth is not determined by an opinion poll. When you're, when you're making a movie with a, with a theme like this, because we've all seen, We've all seen the the Protestant attempts to make a movie about faith, and it's like bang you over the head with you know, except Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior type stuff. But which we do in Catholic should do, just not yeah, of course. But okay, I'm talking about more than non-Catholic and pe when people are hungry, like we were talking a little bit before the show, we were saying when people are hungry, they'll take anything. But as a as as a as those better Catholic movies or or better movies where they kind of move your heart it's less of a book oh, oh. <laughs> we <lost> <laughs> hung up <laughs> so, no well i i was saying because when when you're trying to get to a deeper theme that moves a person's heart like sometimes it's better to go about it in a subtle way because i i forgot how good this movie was like this is this is the kind of movie that a father should watch with his son to give his son a lesson in standing on your convictions, right? So we, 
in in 2020, I almost lost my job, but I put my foot down on, on this issue. I said, I'm not going to cross this certain line. And watching this movie from 2016 almost mm -hmm. seemed like prophetic, like you were you sensed something that was coming to give people a little bit of conviction to stand stand their ground for what was heading our way. Well, you know, I think many people are faced with these kinds of decisions every day. Um, and it was just your turn in the barrel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's like, uh, you know, it happened to Desmond back in the 40s. And, you know, it, it, it uh, we'll all be faced with something like that one day. And most of us don't pass the test, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We think we will, but then we yeah. come up with an excuse. And it's not that we have malice in our heart. We just we all have excuses for the compromises we make. Sure, because, you know, I mean, you can kind of uh, sometimes sticking by your guns or standing your ground and you end up in a in a, you know, in a maelstrom of hassle, you know. Yeah. And and uh, you, you think, oh, do I really want that? You know, do I you know, am I going to spend the next year of my life dealing, crawling out from underneath this rubble or, you know, and so it's. Uh, and I, know all four I, of us. I get why people, you know, take the easy choice, you know. Yeah. All I've, four taken, of us. I've taken the easy choice all the time. You know, we but I know that. we all did the right thing on the medical mandate and all four of us and and some of us have paid for it. But it's now in retrospect, it's always worth it, you know. Yeah, I mean, you, it's all starting to come out about that stuff now. Mm -hmm. I think it really is. And and everybody kind of, everyone I talk to regrets their decision. Uh-huh, exactly. Yep. Rob, what was your thought on uh, um, just that scene when, you know, he almost shoots his dad, uh, Desmond Desmond Doss almost shoots his dad in Hacksaw Ridge? Did you have some thoughts on that? On that scene... You get this this real sense that that obviously he wanted to to protect his mother, but also you could tell he had years of resentment towards his father. Mm -hmm. In in he says it right after the scene that that he murdered him in his heart, but I think he also realized that he had been murdering his father in his heart, you know, for for years at that point, and that really hit me hard personally because of the the my own relationship that I had with my father growing up, it wasn't wasn't near as it wasn't near as bad as what was portrayed in the movie but i noticed um one thing i had to deal with as my father came to the end of his life was was reconciling with him and realizing that the years i had spent um with that resentment in my heart i'd i'd murdered him in my heart um and lost years years with him um and it was just i could understand how that action would would drive that sort of motivation and it how how do you get how do you portray that to to an audience in the way you did is that is that difficult to do is that difficult to have get the actors to do no i think everyone has a basic understanding of like resentments that we hang on to and 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 as you said uh father nick uh the the, the um you know the the act of resentment isn't doing anything and any damage to the other person generally it's you're really just injuring yourself so uh you know um harboring those things uh, uh eventually it's just harmful to your own psyche and as you say uh wasting time you mm. wasted time and how mm. many times have you heard that someone on his deathbed said i spent all this time hating people and and uh resenting people and and now the end is near and I wasted all that time. And I should have just, you should have made the peace, you know? Yeah. yeah. I have a little tag on question of that. I was reading about maybe several years ago, they've tried to make numerous movies or a couple movies. They've tried to make a couple movies based on like tension between the mother and the son or the mother and the mm -hmm. daughter. It never really takes off. It seems like all the blockbusters from Lion King to Star Wars to Braveheart, they all have something to do about a dad who didn't fulfill his role or a dad that you, you know, the hero holds some resentment to why Mel, do you think that like 80% of the blockbuster movies have something to do with tension with the, with your own biological father, not tension with your mother? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, they, they do films about women with tension with their mother. Yeah. But they never succeed like lion King or Braveheart or star Wars. Hmm. I don't know. That's a good question. It is a common theme, of course, 
um, you know, that uh, uh, one always measured some, I, I did it myself. You, you measure yourself against uh, your own father. I mean, you, you're born, you look up to him, he, you know, he's, yeah. he's like God to you when you're little. You, st- you, you begin to see his flaws as you get older. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and eventually you come to some kind of way to reconcile that. It, and you may have had a wonderful experience with the man, you know. Uh, I had a pretty good experience growing up with my dad. Um, yeah. You know, there were moments where you you were like, whoa, you, where there was a miscommunication or a um, uh, something that, that went on for years. And I noticed that with my own sons, too. Mm-hmm. They understood something totally different to what I understood about mm. what was between us and our relationship. And it was like kind of a, it was an interesting thing that uh, and I, I feel actually pretty good that they were actually uh, men enough to tell me what, what oh. their thoughts had been and that I could actually clear a misconception up um, yeah. because, uh, you know, but, but it's a common theme through all our lives, I think, you know, even in the, in the, in the most harmonious of uh, uh, familial experience, I think you're going to have uh, some kind of, you know, there, there's always got to be some kind of conflict, I think, with the, with the parents and the kids. Yeah, I like that, that notion it's misunderstanding. That makes a lot. And by the way, mm-hmm. I mentioned your father's name and the memento for the dead and the mass, the altar behind mm-hmm. me today. Well, um, the uh, Hutton, right? That's him. Yeah. Um, no, and... Uh, you know, I only asked Mel for a favor about a year every year. And last year at this time, he FaceTimed my mom uh, before she died about three, three weeks after that. My mom died on um, uh, April 3rd. And since then, it's been interesting. You know, I, I came from a pretty liberal Catholic family. And my dad and I had a conversation. He never really understood why I became a traditionalist. And maybe three months ago, we had that talk. And I thought it was going to kind of turn into a theological debate. And he said, thanks for explaining that to me. And when he said that, it kind of hit me. Wow, there was like decades of theological tension behind what could have been a simple five-minute conversation as it was. So I'm just agreeing with you, Mel, right there, that it, it sounds like some of these difficulties between father and son. I mean, there's there's families that have a lot worse tension. There's abuse and things like that. But sometimes I think there can be harboring resentment for just simple miscommunications between father and son. Well, yeah, I remember an experience. I, I went to my dad and, 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 and uh, it was like... Uh, it was at a point in my life, I was about 35 or something. And he was, you know, he, he was about 35 years older than me. Right. And <clears throat> so, and I thought, you know, I, I sort of feel like I can't measure up. I feel like he expects a lot of me. I, I, you know, and am I, am I measuring up? Am I good enough? And, and, and I kind of, you know, uh, sort of went to him with, with, a, with an experience that where I disappointed myself. And I knew I would disappoint him. And I told mm. him all about it. And I kind of coughed it all up and and uh, and laid it all out for him and really told him who I was, you know. And uh, he just looked at me and he said, whoa. He said, you're being awful damn hard on yourself. And that mm. to me was this kind of like revelation that he, you know, I didn't. he wasn't this kind of judgmental kind. You know what I mean? It was like. He I mean, got the guy it. just the guy just loved me. He was and and, and yeah. he, it was, <clears throat> and I probably wasn't telling him anything that he you know that he no. hadn't been himself or thought himself or you know. So it was like, I think, yeah, I think you just hit it on the head. And measure. I didn't think I was going to mention the Lion King three times in a podcast. <laughs> the Lion King. I mean, that's the thing is like he, he's not measuring up. That's that's exactly the key. I think in all these movies with. I don't like to say the word daddy wound or father wound because it's so overdone in the psychological world, but really um, it's this measuring up thing. I think, do you measure yeah. up your dad's expectations? That's, that seems to drive the conflict in a lot more movies than measuring up to your mom. Cause your mom's always going to accept you. It's not that I'm saying the, the movies with the moms fail because I don't know whatever reason people want to put in my mouth. I think it's because everyone knows your mom's going to kind of love you no matter what. Most moms, not all moms, most moms are going to love you no matter what. But you always, you always wonder, do you, are you living up to your dad's expectations on things? Yeah. And dad could be, you know, generally speaking, he's harder to get. I mean, they don't have that same kind of maternal kind of connection with their offspring. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's something that is <clears throat> acquired. And, um, mm. you know, I mean, I feel pretty tight with all my kids, but like, 
<clears throat> I'm sure I, I'm, I'm kind of like a more had, harder had, figure had, than their mother, but, but that's well, just the one way of your it sons is. Was, one of your sons was in this movie, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. One was. Yeah. He was. Uh, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, Mel, I think we're going to we're going to actually show some clips and um, we're happy to let you go. If you uh, speaking of family, got to get your family or if you would like to join us for the clips, we're going to he's going to show a few of them and we're going to discuss them with or without you. So we're super thankful you joined us for a full 25 minutes. You're welcome okay. to stay or either yeah, way. Yeah. What what clips are you showing? Good ones, I hope. <laughs> yeah. They're so all great. What we usually what we usually do is we we take a little clip from the movie and we use that as kind of like a launching platform to see if it leads to a deeper discussion. So, you know, whether it's about the faith or yeah. whether it's... it's just, yeah, usually the Catholic faith is what we discuss. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, it's like, I think, you know, I, I was, um, it, 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 he's, he was an extraordinary individual and, and, uh, showed great courage. And it, I think, uh, a lot of it was given him from above because he was a believer and, uh, and he just, without hesitation, just, put his life on the line for everybody else's. And mm -hmm. that to me is, uh, that's, that's an extraordinary thing. I had and, a question uh, just to, to go back a few minutes on the, uh, just what an extraordinary man Desmond Doss was um, saving even his Wikipedia page. I looked at his Wikipedia page before we started recording and it said he saved 75 people. Did you get any pushback from people, Mel saying that was an exaggeration? The movie uh, just went too far. There's no way someone well, saved that many lives. De Desmond, they they attributed seventy five to him. Desmond said it was fifty. Okay, now, but still, still, a, still, that's that's got to be uh, overnight. Yeah, and, and well, it's got to be even more than what was seen in the movie. I mean, so anybody that have, says have, you, have you ever weight, tried to drag a guy who's dead weight? Yeah, I mean, as a paramedic, we have I had uh, stretchers and firefighters, but not no, not dead weight like that. No. I mean, no. how did he do even 50 guys? How did he do it? I mean, on little crazy. food, little, little water, being exhausted, working yeah, through yeah. the night. I yeah, mean, yeah. just absolutely, absolutely stunning. The, the, the crazy thing is this movie, like the war scenes are on par with Saving Private Ryan. Like, and, and you did this movie for like $27 million, which is unheard of. Yeah. It, it's, it really is such a low budget. And the war scenes are so realistic that, it, it was chilling to watch. Like it was, you, I, I couldn't believe how well done the war scene. It felt like two separate movies. It felt like, like the beginning was just this whole movie about this young guy who's going through this yeah. thing with his conscience. And then the second half felt like watching Saving Private Ryan. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Well, um, we had some, you know, I, I like to sort of put on a show. You know, <laughs> there's there's, there's hey, a lot of things, there's a lot of things blowing up and a lot of bullets flying around and, <laughs> I just Rob, run a few clips, Rob. Okay. This first one, this first one's a little longer. It's about two, two and a half minutes, but it's the, it's the scene where he fights his brother, hurts his brother. And like you talked about earlier, Mel, where <laughs> he's, he's looking at, at the story of Cain and Abel in, in that, that picture on the wall. So yeah, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to jump off guys. So I'll see you. Okay. Right, thank you so much. Bye. God bless you. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Okay, guys, so that, that was our interview with Mel Gibson. Um, we are going to actually do the clips in a separate show, so we hope everybody enjoyed that interview. Um, and, that, I mean, that was uh, – Father Nick, thank you for doing that for us, man. That was very cool of you. Great. It was a great forum to uh, to have him on to, so thanks for your guys' show. Yeah. All right, so we'll see you guys on the live show. Actually, you're going to see the live show before the interview, so it's going to be a little bit backwards because we're about to jump on live right now. So we'll see you guys in a few minutes or actually – yesterday. God bless you all.